Hello everybody, it's my pleasure to talk to you today about Utah's rare and unusual fern diversity. And before I forget, uh, this will be a, a very um, cursory talk. I'm not going to get into much depth about very many things, but I'm always delighted to talk about ferns. So please, my email address is there at the bottom. Don't be shy. Uh, please do reach out. So first of all, you might be asking, ferns of Utah, uh, what is this all about? Well, of course, uh, we're botanists, and Utah is perhaps not best known among botanists for its fern diversity, but we do have a great array of, of ferns, including beautiful ones like this little Pelea, uh, and uh, those fern, that fern diversity is primarily in montane habitats, um, so we are blessed with many high elevation habitats here, uh, but also, and perhaps less well understood, in rocky habitats in the Xeric South. So there's a whole suite of ferns that grows in rocky habitats uh, in deserts, effectively. And so if you were to go on to intermountainbiota.org, which is the uh, herbarium specimen network uh, where you can uh, see all the herbarium specimens that have been digitized for Utah, you will find that there are over 4,000 records. So, so quite a decent uh, array of collections. Similarly, uh, if you go to iNaturalist, you'll see that there are over 3,000 observations of ferns uh, from Utah. So again, not a huge diversity, but pretty impressive, and certainly enough conspicuous uh, members of the fern flora to attract the attention of many members of the public. And again, you can see here the same sort of general pattern uh, where we get an abundance of ferns reported from northerly, more um, um, higher elevation habitats typically, uh, and then again, in the Xeric South. So what do these look like? Here's our top 10 uh, most observed species in Utah, uh, at least uh, in iNaturalist. Uh, we see they're dominated by horsetails. Here we have some horsetails here, here, and here. But we do have those Xeric uh, desert inhabitants. So the main hair fern that you can see here grows in seeps. Um, on cliff faces typically, or around waterfalls in, in uh, uh, very dry habitats. Um, the Myriopteris similarly, very dry habitats. And then we see a suite of these more montane species like the Cystopteris, um, and the Teridium, and the Polysticum. So I'm going to jump right into it uh, in terms of talking about a little bit of this diversity more specifically. Uh, and I'll do so by jumping to a group called the Eupolypods. So the eupolypods is a major clade of ferns that is divided into two subclades. There's eupolypods 2 here and eupolypods 1 down here. And these two clades together comprise over two-thirds of extant fern diversity. So they're, they're huge groups of ferns. Um, and despite their size and the fact that they really are quite heterogeneous, there are a few ways to recognize members of each group. Uh, for example, members of the eupolypods 1 almost always have round sori, uh, and they almost always have many vascular bundles in the base of the petiole. So if you cut the petiole off at the base, you'll see a pattern like this with many vascular bundles, whereas if you do the same thing with a member of the eupolypods 2, you'll see that they have two big uh, um, uh, vascular bundles instead of that circle of many, uh, and they also usually have linear sori, so elongate sori rather than round. Eupolypods 1 is the bigger group, but we're not going to talk about it at all today. Instead, I'm going to jump directly uh, into Eupolypods 2. Uh, I have some ulterior motives for this. But one of the good reasons to go to Eupolypods 2 is it's well represented here in Utah. So here are the observed species in the Eupolypods 2, again in iNaturalist. And we can see that we have some of our most commonly observed species as well as a good array of species that get to be quite rare uh, and, and are indeed rare species here in Utah. I'm going to talk about a few of these very briefly, and I'll start with the Aspleeny ACE, the Spleen wart family. Globally, this is a huge family. Uh, it includes a lot of species that occur as epiphytes, as well as species that occur terrestrially or on rocks. Um, it's temperate and it's tropical. It has a few sort of technical characters, such as the way, such as the morphology of its scales, but then it has some characters that are really quite easy to recognize uh, in the field, such as the fact that it has linear sori on one side of the vein. And I'll do this, I'll take advantage of this photograph to do a quick tangent about fern morphology. Um, 
The single most important thing to observe in a fern, if you encounter a fern in the wild, um, is the pattern of what are called a sori. And the sori are the clusters of sporangia. So they're the, the spore-bearing portion of the plant, and they'll be on the underside of the leaves. So um, if you take only a single photograph or you note only a single thing, make that the underside of a fertile leaf of a fern and that, with that information alone, you can identify most fern species, uh, at least here. Um, and actually, it's, it's true for most of the world. If the underside of the leaf looks like this, with these linear sori, so again, the sporangia are clustered into these elongate clusters, these elongate sori. Um, one of these is called a sorus, multiple or sori. And especially if they're arranged in this sort of herringbone pattern, you can be confident that you're looking at a member of the Aspleniaceae. In our case, uh, it'll be a member of the genus Asplenium, the spleenworts. If instead that sorus is elongate, it's not round, but it hooks. So it's either moon-shaped or hooked shape, or sometimes completely hooked around, um, then that is a member of the lady fern family, the Aspheriaceae. We don't have too many of these here. I think actually we only have two species in our flora, but uh, globally it's a very uh, rich group of ferns. Then we get into some uh, genuinely tricky ones in the woodsy AC. And I'm going to emphasize these a little bit because they're a, a useful group to know for field botanists, in the sense that they're both pretty common um, and they can be easily confused with other common groups, in this case, Cystopterus, which I will uh, get into in just a moment. But woodsia, in the genus Woodsiaceae, are small ferns of rocky habitats. Uh, some species are, are very xeric, um, but our more common species are all more uh, montane. They are your classic small ferny fern, as is Cystopterus. They look a lot like Cystopterus, except for three main features. One of which is that the veins and the leaves don't go all the way to the margin. You can often see the vein ending just before, you can kind of see it in here, just before the margin, sometimes in a bit of a swollen tip. Um, the plants are often glandular or scaly, and I'll show you a, an illustration of that in just one second. And they have a particular endusium. An endusium is a name for the structure that covers the sori, covers the sporangia um, on the underside of the fern, so it covers the sorus. In the case of woodsia, at least our species, is, compo is composed of little filamentous segments. So this is Woodsy Oregana. Here's another shot of Woodsy Oregana showing the underside. And you can see, if you look closely, all the little glandular hairs along this plant. So this is uh, uh, one of the main characters of Woodsia. And you can also see, if you squint really closely, these sort of filamentous uh, projections that are curling around and covering that sorus, at least somewhat. That's the endusium of Woodsia. Um, again, very common ferns, or, or quite common ferns, will be commonly encountered, um, but easily overlooked. And all of this is mostly an excuse for me to get to talk, to, talk about Cystopteridaceae, the fragile ferns and the oak ferns and their relatives. Um, this is the group that I am most interested in, and I will take this advantage uh, to sort of tell you some of the interesting biology of this group as well as introduce you to the main characters that we'll find here in Utah. So there's one common genus in Utah, Cystopterus, uh, the fragile fern. Like Woodsia, the ones that we just saw, these are small ferns of rocky places, except that they have their veins going all the way to the tip of the leaf. If you get a close-up view, you can see that quite clearly. Um, all the way sort of to the edge of the leaf margin, I should say. Um, they're not scaly or hairy, and they have a unique endusium that arches over the sorus like a hood. And we can see that a bit here. So, well, you see it really well in the inset. Here's that endusium that's arching over the sorus. Um, I just said that they're not glandular. That was a bit of a lie. There's one species that is highly glandular, especially on the endusium uh, here in Utah. One species that's less so. But you won't find those sorts of glands uh, uh, being common along the leaf. Um, and they're restricted to rare species here. The common species in Utah don't have them at all. Here you can see another photograph of the underside of a leaf of Cystopterus fragilis. Each of these black sort of circles is a sorus, a, a collection of sporangia, and arching over that sporangium is this sort of flap-like hood. Um, 
this hood-like hood -like flap, the indusium of Cystopterus. Nothing else has an indusium like that. And so if you get a good photo, you can always distinguish induce, um, Cystopterus from um, Winsia. Now, Cystopterus fragilis, as it's commonly construed, occurs basically across the world. So this is a map of um, uh, taxa that are within the Cystopterus fragilis complex. At one point in time, everything inside a colored uh, shape here was thought of as a member of Cystopterus fragilis. So what's going on here? This is not the kind of range that we typically associate with, uh, with reasonable biological organisms. Uh, and indeed, if we look at it a bit more closely, we see that the members uh, of Cystopterus that inhabit this range look quite different from each other and have quite different ecologies. And so on the right, we have a species that's growing in the fjords of Scandinavia. On the left, we have a species growing in the understory of rich Carolinian forests in eastern North America. Here we have, in our own backyard, a rock-dwelling Cystopterus from, I think, Big Cottonwood Canyon. Uh, here's one that's growing as an epiphyte uh, with orchids in some um, maybe semi-cloud forest in Mexico. Here's another ground-dwelling uh, one that's super divided. This one over here has its leaves one cell thick. What is going on? Why is there so much um, seemingly morphological and ecological diversity within this group, yet we also at the same time are often considering them to be all the same species? Well, it has to do with this process that many ferns do, but ferns are particularly, sorry, many plants do, but ferns are particularly notorious for, which is polyploidy. And so many uh, ferns have double the genome of their parents. So in this particular case, this species, Cystopterus tenuous, uh, I've uh, made its part on this phylogeny a blue bar to show that it's a polyploid. It has double the genome and has one from this lineage here and one from that lineage there. Um, and so it unites these two genomes uh, in, in itself, so it's double the genome of its relatives. And what this does is, first of all, it creates a lot more diversity because these new polyploids, these lineages that are on the blue branches, are reproductively isolated from their parents. So it's sort of like an instantaneous speciation mechanism, although it's more complex than that. It also um, serves to obscure a lot of the morphological divisions you might otherwise expect because it will feature, it will, um, yeah, feature some of the, um, the morphological characteristics of each of its parents. And so you get this what seems like a complete integration of morphologies because you have this repeated formation of these intermediate phenotype plants that are, however, as I said earlier, reproductively isolated from their parents. So they're, they're their own species. Um, and in Cystopterus, especially in, in the fragilis complex, this process contributes uh, a very great de deal to the diversity uh, of this group. And much of that diversity is unrecognized by scientists. So everything that has a little squiggle uh, beside it or has a number uh, after it is something that doesn't have a unique scientific name, hasn't been formally uh, described. And so you can get an idea of how much unknown diversity there is within this group, even from this tiny little uh, section of it. Um, here in Utah, we typically recognize five species. And I'll walk us through these very briefly. First of all, there's Cystopterus fragilis itself, and then Cystopterus tenuous. Um, I'm uniting these two, and I'll explain why in one second. Um, on the right here, this little inset is a bit of a phylogeny of Cystopterus. This is a phylogeny that shows data from the nucleus. And we see, for example, for this copy from uh, Cystopterus fragilis from Utah, that it has three, sorry, this sample of fragilis from Utah, we see that it has three copies of this nuclear marker. Um, and this is basically evidence that it has three separate subgenomes. It is a hybrid um, from that unites three different subgenomes. So it's almost certainly a hexaploid uh, plant. Um, uh, frag uh, tenuous, um, in the true sense, i.e. where the type specimen of tenuous arises, is the one that we include here in the phylogeny, the eastern tenuous, and it has one genome from Protrusa, so that's one parent, and another genome from a member of the fragilis complex down here. 
Um, um, however, Western tenuous, while morphologically similar to Eastern tenuous, does not have a contribution from Bertrusa. I don't have those data visible here, but um, um, basically what this means is that Western, Western tenuous is not tenuous at all. It's another member of the fragilis complex. It's not the same thing as the thing we mostly call fragilis here, uh, but there is no uh, unique name available for it. And so if you are below, I think it is 6,000 feet, uh, and you see a cystopterus, it's almost certainly this tenuous-like thing uh, that doesn't have a name. And if you're above uh, 9,000 feet, it's almost certainly this fragilis. However, if you're in the in-between area, uh, it could be one, the other, or a sterile hybrid between them. Um, and I'm mainly mentioning that just to emphasize how much unrecognized diversity we have here uh, just in Utah. We, we don't know what this species is call, should be called. It doesn't have a, a scientific name. We haven't well characterized it. There's, there's just so much to be done. So this is uh, fragilis and tenuous. Um, these guys are tetraploids. They have four copies of their genome um, here in Utah. We also have one of their progenitors, so this is a diploid species of the arid southwest, Reevesiana. It's a bigger plant that usually grows on the soil and has more creeping stems, forms big patches. Um, and so it would have a sequence down here somewhere, although I haven't included it in this particular phylogeny. Um, we have another diploid, Bulbifera, which is quite distantly related, so it's way up here in the phylogeny. Um, so it's not that closely related to fragilis at all. You can recognize it by its long, attenuate leaves. They sort of just keep going and tapering. Um, they also have vegetative uh, reproductive organs on the other side called bulblets. Um, and so if you find bulbifera, it's usually quite distinct. However, you could potentially be fooled because we also have utaensis, which is the hybrid between bulbifera here. So it's another one of these allopolyploids between Bulbifera here and Reevesiana, which would be down here. Um, and so it looks quite a bit like Bulbifera. It also has its leaves that are widest at the base instead of tapering at the base, but they're not nearly as long and attenuate as they are in Bulbifera. Um, so this is quite a rare allopolyploid, um, but relatively common in Utah. And that is a very brief introduction to our diversity. I hope that uh, everyone gets an opportunity to enjoy it um, and maybe has a bit of an appreciation for some of the processes that generate that diversity. And I'd be happy to talk more.